Wow, that was a refreshing testimony, wasn't it? Thank you so much. The gospel does totally transform. We have, we've all experienced that. It's been a while since uh, I've had the opportunity to be in chapel with you, so I count it a great privilege and joy to be invited back. I don't know how that happened, but whoever pulled the trigger on this, thank you. It's good to be here again. Um, when the Shepherds Conference convened a couple of weeks ago, I gave an opening message at that conference on the subject of the triumph of obedience, the triumph of obedience. That might sound like an oxymoron, but it is not, certainly not in the spiritual sense. And the, the reason I did that is because I think there is a, a dearth of understanding of the role that obedience plays in sanctification. Over the last 15 or 20 years, the Church of Jesus Christ, generally the evangelical church, has done a good job of coming to understand justification. We get that right. We, we sang about it again this morning. We understand the doctrines of salvation by grace through faith alone in Christ alone. We've done a good job on understanding justification. However, it has to be said that the church has been unable to find the clear path when it comes to the doctrine of sanctification. And there are therefore so many different approaches to sanctification. And let me just remind you that as a Christian, you live between your justification and your glorification. Justification is a, a monergistic work of God by which you were forgiven and born again and brought into the family of God as one of his children and received eternal life. That's the work of God. Glorification is also a work of God. When he completes salvation by redeeming you and then redeeming your body and taking you into eternal glory. Between your justification and your glorification is the issue of sanctification. And that takes up your entire life. And there really shouldn't be a lot of confusion about what sanctification is and how it operates. We know the devil would want to confuse people about justification. And he would also delight in confusing people about sanctification. And he's done a good job of that. So if I can, I want to try to clarify this most essential of all doctrines for you as a believer. And that is, what does it mean to be sanctified? And how do you live a life that honors God? And it comes down to one word. It comes down to the word obedient. Obedient. In fact, Peter says that. He says, as obedient children. And then he goes on in 1 Peter to give instruction. As obedient children. That should be a definition. That should be a label. That should be a description of every child of God. We are obedient. And I want to try to show you that from Scripture if I can this morning. But I have to say at the outset that that is not necessarily what people are being taught in this contemporary environment. In fact, there are some people who fight against the notion of obedience. They think that's too demanding, too commanding, too demanding, too legalistic. There is resistance to the issue of obedience, amazingly, in contemporary evangelical Christianity. Let me illustrate. A contemporary church leader who rejects the idea of obedience, and I mean wholesale rejects it, 
reduce the Christian life to an absurd question. This is his question offered to a Christian. What are you going to do now that you don't have to do anything? I mean, his approach to sanctification is to understand that you've got to figure out what to do when you don't have to do anything. How could you come up with the idea that as a Christian you don't have to do anything? What about all the commands? But nonetheless, this is extremely popular. And this particular pastor and writer goes on to say this. We are not under law. Then he says it again. We are not under law. You can't live under duty. You can't live under bondage, particularly the bondage of necessary obedience. You are free in Christ. You can't live under the bondage of necessary obedience. You are free in Christ. Well, as it turned out, he wrote a book on that. In fact, he wrote a couple of books on it. And then it was discovered, not surprisingly, that though he was married and had a family, he was engaged in sexual deviation with multiple women. It's a convenient theology for those who are clinging to their sin. It's a convenient theology to um, salve your tortured conscience. To say, I don't have to do anything. I'm free. It's an old heresy, and it goes by the name of antinomianism from Namas, the law, anti against the law. And it survives, antinomianism does, in every generation of the church. Every generation. Because just as much as Satan would corrupt the doctrine of justification, which he does on a massive scale in every false form of Christianity, every work salvation system, so he wants to corrupt the doctrine of sanctification to hinder believers from having an effective ministry. I've been dealing with this for most of my ministry life on a fairly large and uh, direct level. It was back many years ago that I wrote a book called The Gospel According to Jesus to address a form of antinomianism which said you could have Jesus as Savior without acknowledging him as Lord. There was nothing in justification that required you to do anything, repent, be obedient, or anything else. That no lordship salvation, as it was called, really came crashing down under the weight of what the scriptures said. At the time, that was called cheap grace. It was called easy believism. And it was a huge issue. It was propagated by most evangelical schools. That was many years ago. The issue still exists today. Isolating justification from sanctification as if you could have one and not the other. And the motive for that is always the same. Well, we're trying to protect the gospel from legalism. We, we don't want people to think they have to obey because that's legalism and we have to protect the gospel from that. Let me help you with that. Good friend of mine, Sinclair Ferguson, has written a book called The Whole Christ. Listen to what he says. The wholesale removal of the law seems to provide a refuge for the antinomian. But the problem is not the law, but the heart that remains unchanged. Get that again. The wholesale removal of the law seems to provide a refuge for the antinomian. But the problem is not the law, but the heart that remains unchanged. 
If you have trouble with the law, it's not that you understand grace better than everybody else. It's there's something wrong with your heart. This is a deception. Let me see if I can help you to understand it. The antinomian thinks he's free from the law. He's not. He thinks that because he has no duty, no necessary duty to be obedient to the law, he's free from the law. The truth is, he is still bound to the law. The antinomian is as much a legalist as a Pharisee would be a legalist. Why do I say that? Because the antinomian seeks to define his relationship to God by the law. He seeks in going the opposite direction of rejecting the law to free himself from the law. This is a complete delusion. The truth is that the antinomian is a legalist. Why? Because he is defining his relationship to God by his relationship to the law. He is saying, I'm not bound by the law. I'm free from the law. So he's talking about his relationship to the law. The legalist says, I'm bound to the law. I'm not free from the law. He also defines his relationship by the law. The legalist says, you must keep the law to earn God's favor. The antinomian says, you must not keep the law to earn God's favor. And both of them define their relationship by the law. He has not escaped. The antinomian has not escaped bondage to the law. He is not free from the law. Now, let me tell you what I'm driving at. True salvation is never defined by one's relation to the law. It is defined by one's relation to whom? Jesus Christ. Not the law. I would never define my relationship to God by the law, either by my keeping the law or being free from keeping the law. The antinomian thinks that he is free from the duty to obey, free from the responsibility to obey the law, believing that he has therefore defined himself as truly Christian, but he has not because he has not defined himself by his relationship to Christ. Antinomianism perverts the gospel by minimizing the doctrine of regeneration, by basically defining salvation as an altered relationship to the law rather than a new relationship to the living Christ. The antinomian is not unlike the legalist. The legalist tries to earn salvation by keeping the law. The antinomian tries to earn salvation by rejecting the law. Both are caught up in defining their lives by the law. This is 180 degrees in the wrong direction from true Christian sanctification. It's the opposite of what you should be thinking. What you should be thinking is this. I love Christ. And because I love Christ, I love His Word. And because I love His Word, I love His law. It's a trap if you find yourself caught up 
in any form of Christian doctrine that tells you you are not responsible to obey the law. You are. But not out of obligation to earn favor with God. That is legalism. But out of love for the one who is the very personification of the law. What is the law? The moral law of God we're talking about is simply a reflection of the divine nature. The commandments, all commandments that are in the spiritual and moral category, <coughs> excuse me, literally reflect divine nature. Simply stated, if your relationship is to the living God through personal faith in Jesus Christ, then you love God and you love Christ and you love the law. A true believer could never say, I don't have any obligation. I don't want to be caught under any rules. I want to be free in Christ. That betrays maybe an unregenerate heart. Let me show you why. Open your Bible to John chapter 14, and I'll show you some familiar scriptures that get at this, and then we'll kind of expand it a little bit. In John 14, verse 15, If you love me, you will what? Keep my commandments. You're not bound to the law. You're bound by love to the Lord. You see people going around with a little bracelet that says, what would Jesus do? I'll tell you exactly what Jesus would do. He would obey the law of God to perfection. He himself declares, I only do what the Father shows me to do. I only do what the Father commands me to do. I only know what, do what the Father wills me to do because of my love for the Father. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Drop down to verse 21. He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. I mean, do you see this? This is the simple reality of defining sanctification not as a relationship to law, but as a relationship to Jesus Christ. He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and will disclose myself to him. When you love the Lord... And when that love is manifest in your willingness and eagerness to obey his commandments, all the blessings of heaven open up to you. Verse 23, Jesus answered and said to Judas, not Iscariot, one of the disciples, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our abode with him. Do you understand what that's saying? That's saying Christ lives in and the Father lives in people who keep his commandments. That's what obedience is. Verse 24, he who does not love me does not keep my words. So you could say, he who does not keep my words words does not love me. It's that simple. Over in chapter 15 and verse 10, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. And here's the test. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. You know, in John 17, Jesus said, I sanctify myself. How did he do that? 
by ever and always and only obeying his Father's commandments. That's how he demonstrated his love to the Father. Down in verse 14, you're my friends if you do what I command you. This is the only possible way to define true sanctification. You love the Lord and you love him so much that you desire only to do his will. Your relationship is not to the law, it's to him. But since he is the perfection of the law, and since his desire is that you obey that same law and thus demonstrate your love to him, your relationship with him is defining. And it inevitably leads to obedience. If I were to ask you, what is the goal of pastoral ministry? Galatians 4.19, Paul says, I have birth pains until Christ is fully formed in you. What would that look like? What would it look like if Christ was fully formed in you? I mean, if you were perfectly Christ-like, what would that look like? It would be perfect obedience to the commands of the Father whom you love. That's what Paul desired. To the Corinthians, he says, I wanted to present you as a pure, chaste virgin to God. How do you define that? What does that look like? What does Christian purity, Christian virtue, Christian holiness looks like, look like? It looks like Christ. And Christ is the model of the one who kept the commandments. In Colossians chapter 1, at the end of the chapter, Paul basically defines the goal of ministry. Listen to verses 28 and 29, Colossians 1. We proclaim him, that is Christ, the hope of glory, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may Present every man complete in Christ. For this purpose also I labor, striving according to the power which mightily works within me. What's the goal? That every believer would become like Christ. Ephesians 4, the body of Christ functions so that we all come to the measure of the fullness of the stature of Christ. So when you're thinking about sanctification, understand it in that singular way. Sanctification is to be like Christ. That's pressing for the mark, for the prize of the high call, in God, uh, high call of God in Christ Jesus. The, the final high call will be, we will be like Christ. In the meantime, we aspire to be like Christ, which is to love the Father to the degree that we keep his commandments. I want to show you something in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. So go there in your Bible. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. There's a lot here. But I, I want to look, have you look at another defining aspect of Paul's view of sanctification. You can, you can start at verse 3. 2 Corinthians 10, 3, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. In other words, we're human. We walk in the flesh in the sense that we're human. But we don't engage in the spiritual battle according to fleshly weapons. Verse 4, the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh. They're not human devices, but divinely powerful to the destruction of fortresses. Paul's talking about his ministry, and he's saying, I don't use any human weapons. Ours are divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. Fortresses are described in the next verse as speculations, 
logismos, ideas, theories, viewpoints, philosophies. We are destroying speculations. What kind? Every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. So here is ministry. Here is evangelistic ministry. The destruction of all anti-God ideas. That's what it is. You bring the divinely empowered Word of God, the truth, to smash all other ideas raised up against the knowledge of God. And then notice this. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Paul, what's your goal in evangelism? To smash all anti-God ideas and to bring every thought to the obedience of Christ. What is the obedience of Christ? It's that obedience in which Christ offered perfect obedience to the Father out of love for him. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. That's why the Great Commission says that we are to teach men to do all things that I have commanded you. Matthew 28, 19, and 20. We, we go into the world, we preach the gospel, and we teach people to observe everything that has been commanded of them by God. There is nothing in the New Testament, or for that matter, the Old, <clears throat> that postulates some alternative view of sanctification where you have no responsibility to be obedient, where you, by your indifference to the law, place yourself in a position of sanctification. The Bible knows nothing about that whatsoever. In fact, this is so important, so important. Go back to the text of 2 Corinthians 10. He says we want to bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And then the next verse, we are ready to punish all disobedience. Wow. We are ready to punish all disobedience? This is pastoral care. You punish disobedience. The Christian life cannot be defined in any other way than obedience that is willing and joyful and satisfying and fulfilling because it is driven not by law, but by love. That's the only way to be sanctified. If you love Christ, you keep his commandments. There's no other way to understand this. In Romans 6, Paul says, you were the slaves of unrighteousness. Now you are the slaves of righteousness. This is submission. This is submission. And a minute ago, I commented on 1 Peter. I'll read it to you. 1 Peter chapter 1, because this is straightforward. Listen to verse 14 of that chapter. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which are yours in your ignorance. You're supposed to be an obedient child. And that means you're not free to live the way you used to live. Do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. But like the Holy One who called you, the Lord Himself, be holy yourselves in all your behavior. Why should you do that? Listen to this, verse 16. Because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. That's a command to be obeyed. That is a command to be 
obeyed. This starts at the point of salvation. For example, in John 3, 36, we read, He who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Did you understand that saving faith is an act of obedience? He who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. That is defining salvation faith as obedience. Romans 1, 5 talks about the obedience of faith among the Gentiles. Romans 2, unbelievers are defined as those who do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness. Romans 15, 18, the obedience of the Gentiles, again, is the theme. I love these words concerning Christ in Hebrews 5. He became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation. Salvation itself comes to those who obey the gospel. And what is the gospel? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Repent and believe. That's a command. Saving faith is the initial act of obedience. And that's how you enter in to the life of obedience, which then becomes the defining reality of sanctification. When the Galatians were drifting away and listening to bad theology, Paul said to them, you, you were doing so well who has lured you from obeying the truth? The, the whole of the Christian life is defined as obeying, obeying. That's what it means in Philippians 2, to work out your salvation from the inside out. Well, I think this is the foundation that I want you to understand. And let's... Let's expand our thinking a little bit. There are many popular antinomian ideas, so I'll just rattle off a few of them for you. These are all errant kind of doctrines that are designed to divorce the, the, the believer from duty, from obedience. One is what we could call Gnostic dualism. And the dualism of the Gnostics basically was pretty simple. The spiritual world is good. The material world is bad. So as long as you are right with God in the spirit, it doesn't matter what you do. Your body is not redeemed. Your body is sinful. It remains sinful. As long as you're soul is right with God, you don't have to pay any attention to your body. That doesn't really work in the New Testament since Paul said, I beat my body to bring it into subjection, lest in preaching to others I myself become disqualified. And then there is a, I guess you could call it a God-focused antinomianism, pretty popular among more liberal Christians. God just, just requires love. He requires love. In fact, he requires love to such a comprehensive degree that loving him may mean disregarding some of his laws. I mean, that's probably what, what's behind somebody irresponsibly saying we need to disconnect from the Old Testament. There are so many laws in the Old Testament that are unpopular, that, that will make you unpopular if you advocate them. So just know this, you, you only have to give God love and show love, that's, that's all. That's, that's the whole command summed up. He only requires love. And again, immediately following that is always this, and that love then becomes 
the arbiter of what part of the Bible you accept and what part you reject. If it's offensive to someone who is a homosexual or same-sex attracted or whatever you call that, um, we set that aside because God is love. That's basically saying God has one attribute set apart from all his other ones like holiness and everything else. And that is an inadequate definition of God. The third kind of antinomianism is spirit-prompted antinomianism. Um, This is the idea that the Holy Spirit is working in me and I, I just need to kind of flow in the Spirit and follow the, what I think are the promptings of the Holy Spirit. It's um, sometimes been called let go and let God. It, it was defined by KFW Pryor in a really great book on holiness as quietism. You just sit there and do nothing. Um, contemplate your spiritual navel and the Holy Spirit's going to take over. That also is never presented in Scripture. Never. Command after command after command after command, including the command to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And then there are some who have developed what I could call a Christ-centered antinomianism. Oh, I don't have to keep the law. God kept it for me in Christ. Christ obeyed the law for me. He fulfilled the law for us. Since he did it, I don't have to worry about it. This is very, very popular. They understand that our sins were imputed to Christ, his righteousness imputed to us, his perfect sinless life credited to our account, and they stop at that point Since Christ has kept the law perfectly for me, I don't have to worry about it. All of these are not because somebody found them in the Scripture. All of these are ways to hold on to your sin and salve your conscience. And then there is maybe fifthly what you could call cross-centered antinomianism. We just need to... uh, Run to the cross. We, we need to preach the gospel to ourselves. So many people talk about that. What does that mean? We, we need to come to the foot of the cross and contemplate the cross in some mystical, some uh, transcendental form of meditation and soak up the, the cruelty of the cross and maybe that will kind of uh, warm us up and, and sanctify us. You can't find that anywhere on the pages of Scripture. Nowhere. Nowhere are you told to be sanctified by running to the cross, by preaching the gospel to yourself, by rehearsing something that Christ has done for you in the past. And then there's a sixth kind of antinomianism. I guess you could call it grace-centered antinomianism, All sin is paid for anyway, so why worry about it? All sin is covered, why why worry about it? It's all dealt with. And, of course, that's, shall we sin that grace may abound? May it never be, Paul said. And then maybe a seventh one is what I call lesser sins antinomianism. Committing lesser sins, the idea is, will keep me from the big ones. So if, if, I, if I give a little on the lesser sins, if I can satisfy my, my unredeemed flesh on the, on the little sins level, uh, I can get enough satisfaction so I'm not driving myself to the greater sins. What's wrong with that? You can't satisfy yourself with any sins. What are you to do? And what does it say in Romans? Mortify the flesh. Kill it. Kill sin. So all of these 
offerings of antinomianism fall terribly short. John Murray, the great theologian, said, in the denial of the permanent authority and sanctity of the moral law, there is a direct thrust at the very center of our holy faith, for it is a thrust at the veracity and authority of the Lord himself. You're attacking God, and you're disobedient to His commands. And all the Bible knows about sanctification is that it is the result of obedience. Listen to another quote from an antinomian. The law of God is holy, just, and good. But it becomes a very great evil when it is perverted and used for something other than its divine purpose. It has one singular purpose, writes this writer. It exposes sin and guilt before God, shutting him up to faith in Christ alone for salvation. To use God's law for any other purpose is to pervert and abuse the law. So if you use the law of God as the standard of your obedience out of love to Christ, you have perverted the law of God. That's, that's heresy of a rank kind. Now, I know you know Psalm 119. Psalm 119 is 176 verses. And in those 176 verses, David, basically in every verse except the last one, says how much he loves the law of God. Oh, how I love your law. It's my delight. It satisfies my heart. He goes on and on 175 times. So I guess the question to ask is, is David a legalist? Is he a legalist? That would be a strange accusation. Why did David love the law? Give me the answer. Because he was a man after God's own what? God's own heart. It was a heart issue for him. Because he loved the Lord, he loved his law. He couldn't do anything other than that. Let me see if I can show you something. We have a few minutes. Let's see what time is it. Um, follow with me for just a minute. Go back to Deuteronomy 6. This is, this is important to tie down what we've been saying This is what God has always been after. Deuteronomy 6, verse 1. Now this is the commandment, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God has commanded me to teach you, that you might do them in the land where you are going over to possess it, so that you and your son and your grandson might fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. O Israel, you should listen and be careful to do that, to, to, to do it, that it may be well with you, and that you may multiply greatly, just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Then the Shema, hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. These words which I am committing to you today shall be on your heart. What I'm establishing is God is always after the heart. 
He wants a heart that loves him. These must always be on your heart. Go to the 30th chapter of Deuteronomy. We'll tie this all together. The 30th chapter begins, So shall it be when all of these things have come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you. You shall call them to mind in all nations where the Lord your God has banished you. When you return to the Lord and obey him with all your heart and soul, according to all that I command you today, you and your sons, then the Lord your God will restore your restore you from captivity. Have compassion on you, gather you again from the peoples where the Lord God has scattered you. If your outcasts are at the end of the earth, from there the Lord God will gather you and from there he will bring you back. The Lord your God will bring you into the land which your fathers possessed and you shall possess it and it shall and he will prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers. Moreover, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, so that you may live. The Lord your God will inflict all those curses on your enemies and on those who hate you who persecuted you, and you, verse 8, shall again obey the Lord and observe all his commandments, which I command you today. That's God's standard. It's a standard of obedience. Psalm 37, 31 talks about the law of God being in the heart. Psalm 40, verse 8, David said, I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is in my heart. It's in my heart. That's where God wants his law to be enthroned. If his law is in your heart, What do you mean by that? That you have a heart toward obedience to the law of God because it is his will for you and a reflection of his character and it is the character of Jesus Christ whom you desire to emulate. You will love obedience. You will love obedience. Jeremiah 31, the new covenant. Jeremiah says when I bring salvation to Israel. I'll bring a new covenant. I will write my law in their hearts. This is very defining. If you're a believer, you're not trying to find ways to express yourself in freedom from the law. You're trying to find ways to express yourself by obedience to the law. You don't think that David was carnal when he wrote Psalm 119. Oh, how I love your law. No, he had a heart for God. Anyone who has a heart for God has a heart for his law because God is manifest most beautifully, most magnificently in his law. So, as I said at the very beginning, the Bible only knows one way for sanctification to take place, and that is through obedience to the law of God from a heart that loves God with all its heart, soul, mind, and strength, and desires to obey that law because that is the will of God, and that would manifest the character of Christ, whom the true believer adores. Well, there's more to say, but we'll leave it at that. Let's pray.
And Father, we thank you for the simplicity of the scripture. As profound as it is, its consistency is stunning. Whether we go back to the sixth chapter of Deuteronomy or on into the epistles of Paul, we know everything that you desire of your people is heart obedience, loving you, our great glorious God, loving you for your glory and greatness, loving you for your grace in saving us, loving you for your kindness, your mercies, spiritual blessings that pour out on us every day, loving you because you loved us. And loving you means that we love your law because that law is the fullest expression of the character that we love. And if that's what we love, then obedience is what we long to do. May we be those obedient children who in being obedient open up the floodgates of heaven which pours out blessing upon such obedience Obedience is a command with a promise, a promise of the blessings of heaven falling on the obedient child. May we seek to love you so genuinely that we define our lives not by the law, but by love. And love, says Paul, will drive us to the fulfilling of your law with joy and complete satisfaction. Sanctify us in that way, we pray. In the name of Christ, amen.